Welcome to theCUBE. We're at the New York Stock Exchange office in San Francisco and we're covering Dreamforce 2024. After a great keynote this morning, I have the pleasure of uh, welcoming Adrian Consol, who is the CTO of OWN. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, Christoph. Well, we've uh, known each other for a while. We've talked a few times uh, in the past few years about the fact that somehow people think that there are magical people in the cloud backing up your size environment, mm -hmm. and specifically, namely, Salesforce. <laughs> Why isn't that true? Well, it really kind of all boils down to the shared, responsi shared responsibility model, right? Um, there's a lot of things that Salesforce does do for you in the cloud, right? They worry about the network, they worry about your storage, they worry about the processing. It, what is fantastic is they even worry about the disaster recovery. You know, you get full 100% disaster recovery capabilities. Um, what they don't help you with is the data that you put into the SaaS application. Um, and that's really where OWN comes into play. Um, that data, <clears throat> as they have repeatedly said, is your data. Um, they don't get to use it, fiddle with it, whatever. Um, and along with that responsibility of putting it in comes the responsibility of keeping it there, <laughs> right? Um, and if you think about these amazing SaaS solutions, they're full-blown platforms that have people with wide-ranging access rights, capabilities, there are admins working in there, they're, you're developing things, you're doing new releases, you've got lots of integrations. All of those things put you at risk of either corrupting or losing some data. Um, and so, again, back to that shared responsibility model, understanding what the SaaS provider is doing for you, but then understanding what you are also responsible for uh, is absolutely vital. And one of the things you're responsible for is, is keeping the data in there. Right, and, and it's interesting because there is actually a pretty large proportion of a number of people who do not understand uh, the shared responsibility model. They say they do, but they don't really look at the, the numbers, right? And there are a number of other people who actually think, to my point, that there are magical people yes. out there. <laughs> so I think there's still a lot of education that's needed. Now, uh, talking about Salesforce, obviously there's been a lot of work through the years. They uh, offered um, up a couple of uh, key APIs uh, for protecting the environment, the bulk API comes to mind, but yep. obviously there's always that risk uh, with an environment that you don't manage because, well, it's a service. That's the, the nature of the environment. Uh, that, that, that risk of entropy, in a sense, where you essentially are trying to catch something you can never catch from a backup standpoint. And of course, uh, because it's a shared uh, model, you're, you're not running this in your data center, you can't snapshot a set environment. That would not be nice for other people. No. <laughs> uh, so what work have you done at the API level um, and integration level with Salesforce to be able to provide that consistency across uh, what could be multiple, many, many levels within Salesforce? Yeah, so we work very actively with that team. Um, I actually uh, was at Salesforce for a number of years prior to joining OWN. And uh, that team was part of my organization, so I'm very familiar with, with what they've done. Um, and it's been, a, it's been a great partnership. Um, you know, they produced Buck uh, API v2 um, a few years ago, um, which uh, helped a number of aspects of trying to get the data out. Uh, we've worked with them actively on um, getting files out, uh, which proved actually to be a fairly slow process. Uh, but you know, for some customers who have literally billions of files, right. it's a very, very important part of the of the backup. Um, you know, I think one of the things that has been the best part of working with Salesforce specifically is the richness of the metadata API. So we have had a principle in the company from day one that we literally back up everything. You actually have to do work to turn off certain pieces, and you know, customers do for for security concerns as well. But um, we, we try and get everything. And the richness of the metadata APIs in the Salesforce platform have been great to just, you know, you've, if you add a new object, <coughs> you don't have to tell own, recover. Um, it just finds it and starts backing it up. So well, this ability to be dynamic uh, through the life of, of having our product has been, I think, a huge benefit to a lot of our customers. Right, yeah, because it's, uh kind of complex. You have all of these records, you have, to your point, some essentially it's a semi-structured environment, for lack yep. of a better term. I don't like structured and structured, but I'll call it semi-structured. And you're right, uh, for large organizations, uh, and I mean Salesforce organizations in this, ca in this case, it's, it could be yeah, millions, billions of files very quickly. So another uh, concern uh, that comes up often is, well, every time I hit that API, am I using my
my credit of governor limits. How is that manageable? How do you potentially parallelize access? How do you optimize that? So we have an engine on the back end. It's kind of part of our secret source that um, flips between the three primary APIs that you right. can get data out of um, based on the work it's trying to do at the time. Uh, we also actively use the, the, the kind of the Delta API that says, you know, give me all the records that have changed since yesterday. Um, so that's a, a good way of getting a much smaller set out. Um, uh, so yeah, kind of part of what we've built is the algorithms for auto tuning. When do you use one? When do you use another? Which objects do you use? Which ones for, et cetera. Um, and for the most part, um, we we've have had customers that have some uh, API constraints, not really at the volume level, but a um, uh, number of simultaneous bulk jobs, for example. Right. Um, but that's really been it. In most of the cases, we kind of fly well enough below the radar um, that it's a pretty it's pretty easy. Well, that's important because obviously you, the last thing you want to do is is slow things down or, or even shut down, get shut out of yep. of, of your environment uh, when you're actually trying to protect it so for very good reasons. Well, let's talk about a uh, couple of couple of hot topics. I'll start with the the first one: uh, ransomware, yep. uh, cyber resilience. So, what's your what's your take on ransomware in Salesforce environments? I know there are lots of protections in place, but the reality is it can affect access. It can affect lots of different parts of the infrastructure uh, and not necessarily actual data, but it could also affect the data depending on how uh, creative uh, these people are. So what have you seen uh, and what do you do to help in the context of cyber recovery, which is really what I'm interested in, the outcome, the recovery piece? Yeah, so, um, <coughs> you know, I, I'm unaware of any real ransomware attack on a, on a Salesforce, cus Salesforce customer at this point, which is fantastic. You know, that company spends a huge amount of money I know, defending yeah. against this, um, which is, you know, amazing. Um, but nevertheless, kind of to your point, you, you don't, you, you know, people say it's, it's when, not if, yeah. right? Um, <laughs> and touch wood, nothing ever happens. But it is at vital that you've got an independent copy somewhere else. Um, and that's a lot of what our customers take a degree of comfort in. They, they obviously buy our data protection solutions for more than just the ransomware pieces, but you do have this independent copy. Uh, it is in completely different infrastructure. It's protected uh, by completely different front doors, access controls, et cetera. Um, and it's in a form that is you know, relatively easily recoverable. Um, and that goes in a couple of ways. You can, um, you can obviously get at the flat files. So mm -hmm. we've had customers that have experienced outages who have, um, who, who have just pulled those files and distributed them to people so they can carry on working, mm -hmm. as simple as that. Um, it, with our new Discover product, actually, there's also the opportunity to have yesterday's data available through an SQL interface. So you could also uh, potentially build an alternative access path that way. Um, and then obviously on the back end, we're doing a lot to make sure that it's on immutable storage and things can't change and that you've got validation. We have a specific product um, called Blockchain Verify, which uh, allows you to provably demonstrate that the, the backups have not been modified at all. Um, and so this kind of this separation of, of the data from the source system right. is really a, about the best that you can do in this world to try and prevent the ransomware attackers from going after your backups first and then going after your main data. Right, absolutely, because you, you're right. I mean, the access piece is what probably would keep me awake at night. Um, things can go wrong, people make mistakes, ransomware uh, attackers are, are pretty pretty savvy. And if uh, somebody gains access to your environment, it's pretty easy to go uh, really uh, wreak havoc in, in an environment just yeah. because you have access, and that's uh, unfortunate that, that it can happen. So uh, lots of great initiatives here. So the other uh, big topic, hard to miss, AI. Uh-huh. Yeah, heard very about this one. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, <Just a> bit. <laughs> so I'd like to ask you um, uh, two questions in one, ready? Which is, what are you doing uh, in terms of data protection for AI, and then how do you leverage AI in data protection in your own in your own solution? So, first of all, okay, lots of AI activity. There will be more. Lots of data being created. Uh, probably not as much as we think, but still, I think that number is growing uh, with new models and uh, new uh, the need for more data to create more data. What do you do to protect AI environments 
in the context of Salesforce and then, uh, or extract or help extract some of that data? And then what are you doing in terms of leveraging it for yourself? Yeah, so um, for the first part of the question, the, the primary thing we've been focused on is how do we help customers activate all of that history? We are firm believers that um, in the world of AI and even in the world of analytics, your historical data is the fuel that can help drive your business forward, right? right? Um, and it's bizarre when I think about it each time just how hard it is to collect that historical data. And it's, it's typically not in the SaaS provider's environment. They have uh, often have kind of audit history, but that audit history is not accessible in a normal way. Um, we have literally a snapshot of the state of the org going back every, every day um, for as long as you've been a customer. So uh, our main focus has been building this new product we call Discover. Um, what that allows you to do is very, very simply pick the set of objects, the relationships that you want, um, and we preserve the, the Salesforce structures, um, and specify a time period. So if you want all of your contacts, your opportunities, uh, your leads, and your accounts for the last six months, we will pull all of that out of the backup and arrange it as a time series data set uh, in an SQL or OData queryable engine. So you can bring a Looker, a Tableau, or your, right. your, your analysis tool of choice to the table um, and start doing you know, as simple things as just trend analysis, right? If you're a wealth manager, if you are storing uh, account balances in uh, Salesforce, often it's through an integration and every day the, the banking system replaces the account balance with Salesforce. Right. Well, you can't trend that number, right? You can if you go to the backups, because you can see every day how that number has changed. So this ability to go trend certain values um, in the data set that, that you just can't with the existing systems is, we think, incredibly powerful and part of uh, what we're en enabling our customers to then lead into you know, doing things like churn analysis, um, you know, next best offer, those sorts of things as well. Um, so that's been our, our primary focus. Um, uh, there are other things we think are really interesting in there, um, specifically because our customers already trust us with their data. Um, event monitoring and what is going on in your instance is, uh, we think actually we can bring an interesting dimension to that. Right now that is done typically off, off event, event logs, right? What is a user clicked on? What is a user, what report is a user run, et cetera. Right. Um, we can actually add data change into that, and so we we have work going on internally to kind of augment um, what is a normal user behavior stream with uh, patterns that we see in how the data is changing, and and hopefully get to a point where we can detect uh, malicious activity and other things um, that way. So those are kind of our, our two focus areas. Discover is is available now. We have customers using it, which is great. Um, <clears throat> to your other point of um, protecting those AI models. Uh, we've explored that a little bit. I, I think you're absolutely right. We are starting to build um, models that have taken time to develop, <clears throat> time to train, um, and we're going to want to be able to uh, snapshot those and, and maintain them. We don't have a product in that space at this point, um, but I, I do think that's a big opportunity going forward. Absolutely. So, a couple of things you brought up that are interesting. I think the um, uh, the fact that you literally own, <laughs> pun intended, all of the data and, and the history of it. Let's talk about compliance and, and governance. I think that's another big issue that that comes up often. What can you actually and and again connected to the the, the point around AI. You can't reuse uh, data that's not compliant. It would be too much of a risk. But how do you know what's compliant or not? How can you help? Yeah. So. Um a, a lot of what we've been doing in that space, and that's kind of mostly around our archive product, is um, is being able to allow the customer to s define policies, specifying what can't be kept um, and how to get rid of it. Uh, obviously, some of that should no longer be actioned in the kind of the day-to-day -day operating system, but still needs to be retained for regulatory purposes. The the compliance. The complexity of the compliance space is just mm -hmm. getting horrendous at this point right. and is a real challenge for, I think, many CIOs. So um, Archive allows you to, to take this data out of your, your operational system, uh, get it away from people that might use it for things they're not meant to be using it for, right. but you can still retain it 
in the archive for whatever, you know, seven years or whatever you need to keep it for, and then we get rid of it after that. Um, the other piece that's really exciting is, uh, so we've done a lot of work on our anonymization engine in our Accelerate product. Um, we're now starting to turn that towards uh, production because we've had a lot of customers request, um, look, I, I want to know that there was a record there, but I can't have the person's name in it, or I can't have any PII in it, but I want to know that there was an account, let's say. Um, and so now we can use that anonymization engine to get rid of the sensitive data in the record, but keep you know the fact that, I don't know, the gamer played 255 games, these are the different right. game types, et cetera, et cetera. We don't know who they are anymore, but, but there's still a record there, and that's useful for reporting, uh, right. and potentially for if that person comes back again, right? Yeah. Um, so those are just a couple of examples of, of how the, the system has always been um, data privacy compliant in that um, you can lodge uh, correction and, and forget requests. Um, and what we do, we don't actually modify the backups, but we mask them so that whenever they get read, um, the person that's asked to be forgotten's data does never appears again. So if you have to do a restore, um, you can guarantee that that person's data won't accidentally restore back in. And we propagate that actually into Discover as well. So if somebody asks to be forgotten, it'll propagate through to any of the backups in the Discover product. Right, yeah, and that was, <coughs> I remember a few years ago, that was the biggest question that people had around GDPR. Well, we have to delete everything, forget people. I'm like, well, no, you can't. You have them in your backups and you don't want to forget them. Yep. Uh, they may have obligations. Exactly. Uh, so, uh, absolutely. So that's interesting. So what we're seeing is really the, uh, the convergence or the confluence of uh, cybersecurity or cyber resilience, uh, data protection, and compliance uh, in many ways. So it's sort of the, the new uh, way of managing data. Uh, and certainly in SaaS environments, it's absolutely critical. Uh, look, we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, thank you so Stay much for, uh, for joining us today uh, on theCUBE. And to our viewers, uh, thank you so much for joining theCUBE. I'm Christophe Bertrand, Principal Analyst here at theCUBE Research. We're at Dreamforce 2024 in San Francisco at the New York Stock Exchange office. Thank you very much for watching us.